Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out the radio version of the show every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern on WDJY 99.1 in Atlanta. We also air on a podcasting network in Los Angeles called the 405 Media. There's a TV version of the show that airs on KMVT 15 in Silicon Valley at 8 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday nights. Both versions of the show air in other states. For these show times plus past episodes, please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Daniel Art. He's the CEO and co-founder at Differ Active. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ken, for having me on. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are, are doing with vi- with video is actually really kind of innovative, but maybe before we get into all that fun stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I grew up in Connecticut, okay. uh, middle class family. Um, you know, nothing really special there, a lot of trees and forestry. Uh <laughs> And aside from that, attended some public school, then uh, went to a private school in uh, Southern Connecticut. Okay. Um, have a, I have uh, four brothers and uh, and some parents. Sure. <laughs> you know, pretty pretty standard standard uh, growing up situation. Wow, your parents five boys. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, it was definitely interesting, and uh, me being the oldest, I, I felt like I always. I always had to uh, take the lead on a lot of stuff, sure. uh, but I'm okay with that because I think it, uh, it shaped who I am today, which is uh, not a bad bad thing. Sure. So you went to university at UCLA. How did you kind of make your way west and decide to go to UCLA? Uh, well, so UCLA was the second university that I, I attended. The first one where I actually did my undergrad was um, Northeastern up in Boston. Okay. So I had, I had spent uh, five years there. Um, I participated in their co-op program, which, by the way, is amazing. Okay. And I think every high school student should look into something like that when when they're figuring out where they want to go for school. Okay. Um, what that program basically did for me was, you know, I would go to school for six months, okay. then I would intern for six months, oh, then I'd go back to school. Yeah, and so by the time I ended up leaving Northeastern, I actually had a full full time job um, with one of the companies that I had worked for during that time where I was working. Interesting. Um, and yeah, yeah, it was, it was great. And so, you know, I worked for one of the companies out in New Jersey, which I didn't particularly like the area that I was working in. Okay. Uh, but I found out that they had an office in Beverly Hills. Ah. So, uh, yeah. So upon graduating. Uh, school, they had offered me a job out in New Jersey, but I asked them, hey, is it possible for me to go out to the Beverly Hills office? Okay. Um, and so within literally four days, I had a job in LA. And so I got in my car and I just drove out here seven years ago and I'm still here today. Wow. That's quite a, that's a long drive, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, 3000 miles. You know, it was cool. I got to see a lot of the United States sure, that I had cool. not ever seen. Sure. Uh, but I don't think I ever want to do that drive ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So so why did you pick kind of Beverly Hills in California? Um, you know, when I was growing up, I always had this fascination with California. I had okay. never actually been here, but for some reason in my wait, mind, wait, wait. I wanted you, to you live. You've never here. been to California before you moved to California? Yeah, yeah. Wow, it was totally, that's totally crazy. crazy. That's awesome. Well, so in Connecticut, and most people don't think of, of Connecticut having like beaches, but I grew up near a beach. And okay. so I was always, you know, I'm, I like praise the sun. Okay. And so for sure. me, I, I always wanted to escape the winter. So I thought, oh, San Diego would be great. <laughs> sure. And then, you know, when it got to the time where I, you know, wanted to move, I had a job already set up in LA. So I just kind of was like, all right. Well, I'm going to LA. Never been there, but we're going to do this, and uh, and I love it here, and I don't ever want to move back to the East Coast. <laughs> Fair enough. No, I, that's cool, Matt. So, you you worked for a few years, then you decided to go to UCLA. Why did you decide to go there, and what did you take? Uh, so for UCLA, I didn't actually enroll in their undergrad program. Okay. Um, they have a fantastic 
um, extension program. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, at the time, I was doing tax accounting for most of my clients who were production companies, and I, I got very tired of accounting. Uh, putting numbers in boxes just wasn't doing it for me. But at the same time, I got to know a lot about the movie industry, and I wanted to eventually work for my clients. Okay. So what I did, I started going to these extension programs uh, surrounding film finance, and um, and I, I really, truly immersed myself in entertainment. And through that, I started to build out my network, um, and then which ultimately led me to um, working for Lionsgate Studios. So that, that's pretty much why I, I did UCLA. Okay. Was there like a defining moment that made you want to go into finance, or, or what got you passionate about that originally? Yeah, it's a, it's pretty interesting. I mean, growing up, um, we were a very blue collar family, a lot of plumbers okay. um, in in our family, and for some reason, I was I associated finance and accounting with lots of money, and you know, I think that's like just a very like I don't know the view. I didn't have any real guidance. I was a first generation college student, so I I figured you know what I need to go make a ton of money and pay off my loans as fast as possible. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> I decided to go into into more of the accounting route, which typically does not pay what somebody on Wall Street makes. So I was I was I definitely misled myself. Um, but you know, it's it's kind of great because through all of it, I ended up out here. I learned a ton about accounting. Um, I can navigate anybody's books like no other. And it's been a solid foundation for helping uh, not in, not only in my financial planning career that I had, but also now with our current business. So, yeah, I mean, that's really r- roundabout way of saying it. <laughs> no, I, yeah. I, I think I, I've said it numerous times on the show before. I think like the two skill sets that I think any person having doing a startup, if if you have like, if you're either an accountant or a lawyer, those are probably the two best skill sets to have and can save you a lot of time and money or, or both, right? Oh uh, yeah, tons. I mean, it when it comes to understanding entity formation and just how our books work for, you know, book and tax purposes, um, I know that my other two co-founders would be completely lost and would be spending money on it. So sure. it definitely does help us allocate the funds that we have to things that we really do need to spend cash on, um, which has helped, you know, further the product along probably faster than we would have. Oh, sure. No, that makes sense. So how did, how did you meet your co-founders? Uh, yeah. So, um, Garrett, who's, um, who is one of he was a, a roommate of mine in college. Okay. Um, senior year. I was actually his RA. Um, and he was randomly placed in, in my apartment. Um, and yeah. And so we just ended up hitting it off and, you know, we would go, we were like, you know, we would go out to the bars and we were like buds and we were each other's wingmen. Um, and then, you know, after school was over, Garrett moved to New York. I moved to LA. We still kept in touch. Um, and he was in digital marketing. And okay. so I was in entertainment, he was in digital marketing, and then all of a sudden, you know, we were like, oh, we both have experience in this. What are the problems in the industry? And we were like, oh, here's a problem. Why don't we build something around it? Um, but so Garrett and I, you know, having accounting, finance, marketing knowledge, like that's great and all, but uh, we were missing that technical piece. Sure. Um, and how we met Igor, our CTO and third co-founder, uh, was definitely really random. Um, I had been working at Lionsgate at the time and one of my coworkers, she really, really wanted to get involved in the startup community in LA. And so a lot of the times we would sit in the office and talk about, you know, the business that I was trying to start and how I was going to go about doing it. But she would be going out to all of these networking events at night. And one night she saw this tall, handsome man at one of these networking events (laughs) and she went up to to talk to him but she literally had nothing to say to him except for uh to talk about the business that i was starting and so it turns out he was this ex google employee was from belarus and he just happened to be looking for a new project and she's like oh well you got to meet dan and then we had a meeting with him 
And then I have some buddies who are ex, um, ex um, Amazon employees sure. who now work at Adam Pickett's. And they vetted him for me because I know nothing about technology. <laughs> um, and so they're like, this guy is the man. You should bring him on as a, a third co-founder. And so that's kind of how we all came together. <laughs> that's amazing. So for people yeah. that haven't heard of Differactive, what exactly do you guys do? And how did you come up with the idea? Yeah, so what we do is we take traditional video and we make it interactive. Uh, it's kind of like Pinterest for video. So, you know, maybe you have a YouTube star who is doing a makeup tutorial. Typically what she'll do is she'll put down below in the comment section, the links uh, to the products that she's using. Um, but there, typically there's no context there. And, you know, there's no images, no nothing. We're very visual people. So what we do is we, we give the creator the tools to take all that information she was gonna put down below and put it behind the video in the pause screen. So when somebody pauses it, not only do they see images and descriptions for the products, they see those call to action buttons that aren't just numbers and letters. So we're, we're effectively trying to help content creators monetize their, their creations even further than they would. Um, and so, and the second part of the question was, how do we come up with the idea? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so <laughs> initially, I had I'd gone to a film finance conference and this guy Sky Moore, he's a big entertainment lawyer out here. Okay. He got up on the stage and, and he was basically preaching that in the future all of the content we watch will be paid for by brands. And so in my mind, I immediately thought, wow, that kind of sucks. We're all just gonna be watching commercials all the time. Um, and so that's kind of where we started. We were like, all right, well, if this is true, how do we make branded content feel less branded? Um, and so we ended up finding these guys in Belgium on YouTube. Um, and this is where the name Defracted came from. Um, and they were working on a camera that could track items on screen. Um, so you would, you would, you know, yeah. And they were using RFID technology. And so that's where the differ part of diffractive came from. So if you turn differ around, it's RFID. Ah, interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so we, you know, we we were working with them for a little while, but we realized that you know it's going to take a little while for their technology to really be integrated into the filming process. Sure. Um, so we we started to take a different approach uh, to it. Same concept. We wanted people to have information about items on screen. Um, but we scaled it back and created a software that's super easy to use. But with the caveat that, you know, Differ is still part of our name because eventually down the line, we want to use tracking software to actually map out products on the screen. So we're, we're kind of taking a Netflix approach to it, right? You know, sure. Netflix was not only streaming stuff on, on, you know, on computers. They were delivering DVDs. But they had the foresight to think, like, in the future, we will distribute everything via the net, you know? Sure. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. That's actually quite fascinating. So I, I'm curious then, did you build the first version while you were still working full time? Or, or did you quit? Or, or walk me through kind of the early first version, how it came to be. Yeah, I mean, when we first started this, we just kind of treated it as a, it was like a, a project on the side. Everybody still had full-time jobs. Okay. Um, and, you, you know, we pulled the, together some money, um, and, and we, we actually do all of our development in Belarus. Okay. Um, Igor, Igor has, he's worked with these guys over there for the past, like, 20 years. So, oh, wow. Uh, we're, we're, yeah, we're unique to a lot of startups because, we actually have a long-term relationship with our uh, international developers, sure. um, which a lot of people don't. So, you know, we uh, we got some money together and we built this really crappy prototype to start. <laughs> sure, I, but I think that's uh, good advice, of... right? Like, it doesn't need yeah. to be this amazing three-year-long development cycle. No, it definitely doesn't. Um, I think if you have an idea, just you know, you know, throw a little bit of money into it, see if people get the idea, see if people like actually want to use it. Sure. Um, and so once we did that and we would go out and we'd talk to people, you know, mostly our friends and family, 
um, and say like, hey, what, did, what do you think about this? Like, would you use this? Um, and a lot of people said yes. And we talked to strangers too, especially at networking events. That was the best place where we got um, a lot of feedback uh, was the networking events. But, you know, <laughs> soon after, yeah. So it, it started to get pretty serious and we started pumping some more money into it. Um, and then just last June is when I basically said, if we're going to make this happen, um, I got to leave my job. Okay. Um, and so Igor had already been full-time on it and, and Garrett is about to come full-time on it. So, okay. you know, with the business, not everybody has to be full-time to start. Sure. Um, the business demands a certain amount of tension, attention on certain aspects of it at certain times. Right. And so when you're building a tech product, the business side doesn't necessarily have to be full-time. Uh, sure. The tech guy does to get the product up and running. And then once he gets it there, the business guy needs to go in and put all, you know, go out and shop this thing, whether it be customer acquisition or raise money. And now we're at the point where we need to start doing some heavy marketing. And so Garrett's coming out full time. Gotcha. Um, so you can do it. Yeah. You can do it in stages. Um, it's just, you know, you got to be strategic about it. Sure. So did you guys self fund this originally? Did you raise some money? How did you kind of get that first amount of money together? Yeah, so we all had pretty well-paying jobs. Okay. Um, and so what we all did was we basically did um, quarterly capital calls um, on ourselves, and and we raised the money. The first thirty-three thousand was just us, so that's eleven thousand a piece. It's not that that bad. Sure. Um, and then. Uh, just last June, we ended up raising some friends and family money on convertible debt. Um, we raised another forty-five. Nice. Well, so all That's in great. all, yeah, yeah. And so all in all, you know, to get the product to market and get it to a place where we we actually don't need to spend any money right now, uh, we ended up spending about like eighty thousand bucks in total. Wow. Um, so yeah, so it's it's we're feeling pretty good right now because we have a product that works. Sure. And now we're basically just taking feedback from our customers and, you know, fixing it in their eyes and pushing forward. Sure. No, I, I think that's great, man. And you, you did it on a pretty cheap or like a small amount of money, right? To get something to market and have customers. I, I think that's great, man. Like, congrats to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, I, I hit on it earlier. Our relationship with our developers in Belarus is definitely unique. Sure. Um, I don't think a lot of startups, you know, go into a situation where they have a relationship with these guys and they give them discounts, right? And so, like, sure. our our guys out there, they, they definitely gave us the friend discount, nice. which was definitely beneficial for us. Sure. No, I I think that's great. I, I, I do want to – I'm a little bit curious about – you mentioned you, you actually went to networking events and were kind of demoing this to people there. How did you kind of – work that into the conversation like did you just say hey i'm working on this app do you want to give us some feedback or or how did you kind of go about asking for that because i think it's a great way to get product feedback oh it definitely is i mean you obviously can't go in there with a full-on like you know google forms thing that sure. says fill this out after using it right so you have to you have to kind of like remember what people were saying but i mean for the most part people are very honest especially when they're drinking uh, um, yeah, yes. and so, yeah. And so, what you know, Garrett and I were very, um, we're, I think we're natural networkers. And so we always find a way to just start talking to people no matter who they are. And then, you know, it, it, when you're at a networking event, people naturally always ask you like, what do you do? And then the best way for us to actually tell people what we do is to just show them, um, because sometimes they just don't get it. And so, you know, it was a great, great way of just be like, oh, well, check out, you know, even at the beginning, it's like, here's our crappy app. <laughs> what sure. do you think? And people would just tell us and be like, oh, you know, and then we take that home the next day and think about it and, you know, make changes. Um, I, I think people actually want to give feedback at these events. I mean, you can't just go up to them and say, hey, use my app, tell me what you think. Sure. You've got to ease into the conversation and become friendly with people. And eventually the conversation will go in that direction. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really interesting. And and to be fair, you and I met at uh, the Media Excellence Awards in, in January in L.A. So, 
like you and I technically met at a, a networking event, which, and then now a couple of months later, you're on the show. I, I think like, just to reiterate the whole thing, I, I think it does actually work like in-person networking. There's two examples in the last like five minutes of it clearly working for kind of both of us. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a, it's a necessity. And I would say to any founder, if you are an introvert and you hate networking, you better find a partner that is an extrovert and loves networking. Sure. Because it, it will push your company uh, further than you can imagine, you know, because you go to these, uh, these networking events sometimes and, you know, you think you're there for one thing and then all of a sudden, you know, you have a lead on a, a customer that you never even would have imagined would have, would have come out of this event, right? You just have yeah. to, it's kind of like throwing darts at a board and sometimes you, you've, you find some hidden gems that it's just like crazy how it happens. So how often would you say you're going to networking events? Uh, we try to do at least one a week, um, oh, sometimes wow. with schedules. And, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great networking events out there that are, you know, they're even like 10 bucks. You don't have to go to things that cost $500. Sure. Um, just like, what we try to do with our networking events is we always go online or go to like just search and search and search, but it always has to pertain to our business in some way, shape or form. We don't just go to random and networking events just because, you know? Yeah, no, I, I think that's also really good advice, right? Like they, they can be really inexpensive or, or free. You don't need to spend hundreds of dollars on these things. And I, I think in some cases you all, not that you don't get good people at the expense of events, but you could get the same quality feedback and, and connections at a, a, a way cheaper event. You know, I, I don't, I don't think that like one's necessarily better than the other just based on cost. Have you found that as well? Yeah. Yeah. I would totally agree with you. And you know, it's, uh, our initial customers, a lot of them have come from these really small events and it's, and I think the reason for that is in small events, you know, it's a more intimate setting. People get to know each other better sure. versus going to like a huge conference. Um, and, you know, from, from your, whatever conversations you have from that event, they just seem to be more personal. And those initial customers that you get on board, you want to have a connection with sure. them like that. Like a lot of our, a lot of the initial customers that I have from these events, they come over to my house and just hang out and talk to me, you know? That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it's like you, you have to get, it's about building those evangelists, right? Sure. And getting people to go out and spread the word about you and your product. And I, and it definitely helps. Um, but I think like the small networking events actually lend their hands very well to, to uh, your initial cu customer base. Sure. Well, and I also think too that a, a lot of times people that go to maybe the cheaper events as well are also starting out and they're looking for other products or services that they can kind of put their brand or company or services into. And like, I, I think the best example is, is almost like the video on your homepage with, with that, uh, uh, the wise fool kind of fashion brand. Like they have you yep. know, people surfing and skateboarding and kind of just doing these activity things. And obviously they're wearing, um, you know, their kind of pant or their leggings and their board shorts and, and stuff like that. And then kind of at the end of the video, it, it pops up with all the different items that you saw in the video and you can, you know, buy and get more information about it. But a, a brand like a clothing brand that's just launching would absolutely want to try out a, a platform like yours whether it's new or it's been around a long time right like they want to get their brand yeah, out absolutely. there so meeting somebody like you and then you build this personal relationship and you know there's been a lot of big brands that have come out of california and other places but it helps when you actually know the founder and they can like you said come over to your house or maybe you guys can meet up at a coffee shop or, or wherever yeah, I totally agree with you um, that, you know, a lot of our first customers are people that are just starting out in the, in like the blogging business or, you know, in the wise full case. Yeah. They're a relatively new uh, clothing company. Um, and so whatever they can do to drive traffic back to their site and if it's free, they're going to do it, you know? Sure. 
Um, just, just as long as, you know, Wise Fool, we've actually done two videos with them. They were one of our first uh, beta testers. Okay. And they didn't, they didn't want to use the first product because uh, the design actually wasn't that great and they didn't want to hurt their brand. And which we totally understand Interesting. because when you're doing video or you're creating a brand, you want to make sure that you're growing the brand and you don't want people to think less of it based on, you know, how your videos look. Um, sure. And so that was one of the catalysts for us to actually like really, really clean up our, our UX design and make it friendly and make it look way more sleek than what it was because people were basically saying, I'm trying to build a brand. If I'm going to use this, it has to look good. No, and, and that's that's like brutally great, honest feedback, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it was hard to swallow at first. It was sure. like, come on, man, do us a favor and use this. But he, you know, Danny, who he's he's an awesome founder. This is a guy that owns Wise Fool. Um, but he was like, this is the harsh reality of it. I'm not going to use it unless it helps build my brand. Sure. And, you know, so, so, you know, it was good. It was good. He pushed us to get to the next level with our product, which we, we loved. Sure. And and then I I think the other thing too, that people sometimes don't realize is somebody like that, that feels like they're influencing the product early on. A lot of the times is way more loyal to you going forward because they're like, wow, they really took my feedback and actually imp- implemented it into kind of the next version of the product. Yeah, yeah, no, it, 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 he has been an, an awesome beta tester for us and we appreciate everything that he's done for us, even though, you know, it was painful to hear, sure. to hear him be like, nope, don't want to use it, yeah. But I also think that having people that will give you that kind of brutal, honest feedback is almost like priceless. Oh, absolutely. You, and it, it's the best thing that anybody could do for us. And so sometimes you, you really got to try and find those people and that might be just going out to strangers and just being like, I need your honest opinion. Cause sometimes your friends and family don't want to give you the feedback that you're really looking for. Yeah, no, I a hundred percent agree. I, I think like when I've kind of done any UX testing with kind of somebody I don't know, whether I've done the design or not, I've always told them like, look, I have nothing to do with the design. I'm like a third party. So just tell me honestly what you think because you're not going to hurt my feelings because I didn't do it. Even if I did do it. And I know it's lying, but like if you tell them like I was the designer on this and I'm really happy with this, they will not, they will try to not hurt your feelings. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Couldn't agree with you more. So I actually, I like that. Um, I like that approach. I think we're going to start to use that more. Well, that's good, man. That's awesome. So <laughs> I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the actual platform. I, I think like you kind of gave a, a good overall how it kind of works. But if for somebody that's creating content or like, you know, um, they're a clothing company or, or something like that where they have products in a video, how do they go about kind of working with you guys to – actually get your platform on top of their videos and they can start kind of cross promoting and selling their content. Yeah. Uh, so first and foremost, they have to be creating digital content. <laughs> That's sure. a must. Otherwise it doesn't really work with us. Um, and they have to be putting that, that content uh, right now on either YouTube or Vimeo and okay. it could be private um, on either one of those sites if they want. doesn't really matter. We just have to basically um, be able to pull that, that video in from one of those services. Gotcha. Uh, the reason for this is, you know, hosting video is pretty expensive. So and we nightmare. basically say, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we, we basically say, tell us where that video is and we'll, we'll pull it into our system. So it saves us a lot of money on as well, which is sure. great um, because we're basically just leveraging other video players. Um, I think the, the terminology people like to say, or the, the saying is, uh, we're building a mansion in somebody else's backyard. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so basically if you're making content, you basically tell us where, where the video is. We give you a software where then you, you cut up scenes. So, you know, maybe you're making a five minute video. You only need one scene. That's fine. But if you're doing an hour long thing, 
you probably want to make, you know, multiple scenes because you could have over a hundred plus items in that video. Right. So anyhow, so it's tell us where the video is, cut up the scenes, and then last, well, it's kind of last, um, make the inventory. So, you know, products, places, characters, anything you want to put in the pause screen of the video, that's where it is. It's in the inventory section. Um, and then basically you drag and drop your inventory into the scene and then you say, oh, I'm all done. We give you an embed code and that is what you use. Um, so <laughs> it's a fairly simple process. Um, it's, and then, you know, the embed code that you put on your website or if you put it on a blog's website, Sure. Um, is the exact same way you do with a YouTube video or Vimeo. Okay, no, very cool. That, yeah. I think that's that's really great. And what is the cost and or how do you guys kind of monetize the platform? Yeah, so we're, uh, we're actually a freemium model right now. Um, okay. You know, we're trying to change the way that people view content and the way that uh, producers of content actually distribute. Uh, so we have to make it free, right? Most sure. people hate change, and so if you're a content creator and you're making up to you know X number of videos and they're in our system, it'll be free. But if you hit a certain threshold based on number of videos, number of clicks, number of items, um, we'll we'll charge you an annual uh, fee. Okay. Other than that, it, it will always be free, and we don't we don't take any of uh, we don't take a piece of the sales that you make. So if you have monetizable links. All the money you make off of those is all yours. So, it's it's it, right now it's simply just uh, a membership model. Interesting. No, that that makes a lot of sense, and I, I think you're you're kind of right when you're when you're doing something a bit different. I think you kind of have to give at least a, a certain amount kind of free, and the the freemium model seems to kind of work for some of this stuff, especially when you guys are kind of onboarding a bunch of brands yourself and and kind of still kind of. Not really necessarily a new platform, but you're you're a up and coming kind of growing platform. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really hard to get people to pay for anything these days. Sure. Um, but the thing that's really valuable is just traction. So, you know, it, you you may think that like letting people use it isn't you know a value to you, but that traction can be super valuable, especially when you start to raise money. Particularly in our case, you know, we're trying to raise a seed round right now. Um, and so a lot of people are saying, like, show us the traction, show us the usage. And, you know, sometimes you just have to say, use it for free to get that traction. Sure. And when I say sometimes, it's mostly all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I like the kind of brutal honesty about this stuff, right? Because I think some people try to sugarcoat it, and I don't think it's bad. Like, a lot of people and pretty much most if not all startups go through the same stuff it's just there's not a lot of people that are openly willing to talk about it as kind of openly as freely as you have been so far today so i think it's great man. <laughs> yeah i mean people got to hear it right um yeah and being an entrepreneur is not easy building something is not easy you know getting people to believe in something is typically not easy sure um so, you know it's so did you save up a bunch of money to actually just like pay your cost of living for for months to kind of give this a go full time? Yeah, yeah. I you know, being a an accountant and a, a manager in financial planning, I'm always numbers based and sure. I everything that I do in my life. I always am planning ahead. Um so for me I, I was very strategic in saving money and understanding, you know, how much runway I was gonna give myself. Um, and so I, I, I would like to pat myself on the back and say, I did a pretty good job for the sure. past nine months. That's awesome. Um, but you know, as we, as we move forward, you know, I have to start to find some other forms of income. And so I've been exploring other, other options for side work and stuff like that. But it is definitely, definitely important, um, to save up a little nest egg or, you know, just be very strategic about when you leave your job because uh one thing that i'm definitely starting to find is that you know the stress of not having money and not being able to live can definitely impact your performance when it comes to your business sure you know, if you're constantly just worrying about you know your finances that means a, a lot of the time that you could be spending you know focusing on the business and growing it 
um, are taken away. Sure. So uh, it, it's very important to have, you know, plan appropriately before you just up and leave the job. You know, but that's me. I'm more of a risk adverse person. There might sure. be people out there just like, I'm just going to do it, you know, so more power to them. But I think it's better to plan ahead. No, I 100% agree. I, I think that's great. But you also set up um, or well, you guys have set up an advisory board as well. What made you decide to actually get an advisory board? And I, I know you picked a couple people. Um, I, I know Allison. I don't know Amanda. But what? What made you decide to set up an advisory board, and and why did you pick the couple people that are on the advisory board? Uh, well, initially we weren't we we weren't really looking um, when we first started. Okay. But then uh, one of my, and one of my friends, uh, it's really interesting how I met Allison. Okay. Um, one of my friends used to work for Enterprise Rent a Car, okay. and she she used to pick up Allison like on a weekly basis because Allison was a customer, and they became friends. Interesting. And yeah, and so then my friend was just like, you know, they got to, she got to know what Allison did, and Alice, and she was like, oh my god, you know what, my buddy does something in this space, and so you know, she basically set Allison and I up on a date, and then uh, we. <laughs> Well, you know, we were just talking. I was like, you know what? You have so many connections in the space. You understand the space. You see value in the space. Um, and so I talked to my co-founders. And I was like, I think this this lady, Allison, she would be a perfect first advisor for us. Because, you know, even if she can't set us up with anything at, at the onset, I think later down the line, her connections and her understanding of where digital content would be, uh, especially when it comes to interact activity, Sure. Um, she would be perfect. So, you know, it was kind of one of those things where we weren't really planning on bringing out an advisor, but it, it just seemed right at the time. Sure. Um, and then for Amanda, um, I knew her from my time at Lionsgate. And, okay. You know, I showed her our initial product, you know, the, that crappy app that I was talking about earlier. Sure. And she was really into it. <laughs> and she really wanted to see it develop. And so basically I came back to her and I was like, look, we – Another strategic play is we want to have somebody in a studio that's sure. an advisor on our board, and especially somebody that believes in the digital landscape and it transforming the way that entertainment will be distributing content later on. Sure. So you know both of them both of them were very strategic um, in terms of they are the people that need to kind of be promoting us in their individual spaces. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I wouldn't my advice to any other founders would be like, don't force the issue on founders because, or on uh, advisors, because you're going to, you're ultimately are going to be giving up part of your company and don't do it just because you want an advisory board, do it because they actually play a strategic role in, you know, the future decisions of the company. Sure. Well, and, and both of them, I ideally could potentially hook you up with your, um, ideal customers and especially like from the Lionsgate side of things like I don't know why you know TV and movies at least when they're streaming their content online aren't using your platform to monetize I, I'm, again right because a lot of times if you yeah. pay for a video or, or you're watching a video online through advertising like if I want to buy that coffee table or those pants or, or whatever I should be able to do that from the content right yeah, exactly. And, you know, uh, you know, in the probably the past 10 years, the distribution of TV um, and movies, you know, they're very dependent on like the big guys like, you know, iTunes or sure. Amazon or, you know, and and even Netflix, obviously. Right. And yep. so uh, they, they don't control those distribution platforms. And so we're moving into a place now where um, people are starting to take control of their distribution. And for instance, in Lionsgate case, um, you know, they're probably going to follow what Disney is doing. Sure. You know, Disney is, you know, they after 2019, their distribution deal with Netflix is done and they're bringing all of their content in house. Yep. So instead of paying somebody to distribute it, they're doing it themselves. So once the content creators take control of their own distribution channels, I think that's when you're really going to see stuff like our our uh, our business take off because people can actually like mold their own distribution uh, platforms. You yeah. see what I'm saying? No, I 100% agree. Yeah. I, I think we're in like a 
a really interesting kind of space right now because even just the the little bit I understand about kind of the whole video TV traditional kind of versus online it's not broken but it's definitely at this like interesting transition where you kind of need to be on both but both are kind of have their their challenges like traditional TV can't is is maybe having a hard time trying to monetize in in some respects and then online content i think in a lot of cases is struggling to kind of get viewership and maybe monetization is easier but like merging the two together it is really tricky would you agree with that yeah. i agree i mean but it's getting easier and easier i mean even my cable today is a digital streaming service i sure. use youtube tv yeah, i don't so use time warner it. You know, and I, I use I use uh, Time Warner as an internet provider, but no no way do I want a clunky cable box. And sure. you also have, you know, ninety percent of the TVs now sold on the market are smart TVs. So sure. you know, <laughs> there's going to be a point in time where anybody that doesn't have a smart TV, they're completely living in the past, right? Yeah. And the beauty of the smart TV is it can connect with all of your devices. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you, we're, we're moving into a place where the TV, you can actually interact with it without a special remote or a special cable box. Sure. Um, and that's, that's where we're going to see the change is when, you know, your computer and your TV are basically almost the same thing. Yeah, I, I've right? always wondered why, like, the monitor technology and the TV technology haven't merged kind of into one thing, but that's a whole other topic. But, um, I, yeah. I think you're right. Like it's it's coming if it's not already at the very early kind of stages of that. Um, but I, I'm curious though. We we met at the Media Excellence Awards, and I'm I was curious to know how did you kind of find out about that event, and why did you decide to go to the awards? Uh, we found out through Allison, our advisor. Um, I I had never heard of it, um, but she was like, "Hey, you should go to this thing and check it out." And you know, for us. Obviously, we were, we didn't submit to be nominated for anything because we weren't we didn't feel that we were ready for it. Sure. Um, but you know it. You know we we like to network, so it was a great opportunity for networking, and also you know we think we might actually submit uh, this upcoming year for some of some of the categories, and it could be some good press for us. Yeah. No, I I, I think it's great, man. Um, that's really cool. So I, I'm kind of curious though. And I, I don't really want to like necessarily talk about anything that you don't want to necessarily mention, but where do you kind of see your platform kind of going? I, I'm guessing you want to maybe move into kind of YouTube TV content or Netflix content or, or other kind of streaming services. But is is there any other kind of where you can kind of see this going or, or the space going? Yeah, I mean, for us, we would love ultimately one day to be basically on every single device or any form of uh, distribution of content. Um, okay. For us, you know, we're, we're building this out and we're, we're focusing in on the user generated content right now because it's a little bit easier to tap into uh, sure. because, you know, we can't just pull video content off of, of Netflix. Sure. Uh, especially because there's way bigger licensing issues there. Um, but, you know, it's, yeah, we, 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 we like to, to be player agnostic and we're hoping that, you know, eventually people will start to catch on to this and we are on every single service. Um, not sure if we can do it alone. Uh, right now we're trying to figure figure out strategic partnerships sure. um, because, you know, in this landscape, uh, you have some big players there that can take you down pretty quick. So, um, yeah, I mean, th I guess the, the easiest easiest thing here is, yeah, we want to be everywhere. Sure. Uh, but it's one step at a time and understanding who the competitors are out there. Sure. No, I, I, I think that's great, man. I, I'm interested to see kind of over the, over the year kind of where you guys take this thing because I think it's really cool. And I, I know, like, it's – kind of been tried a bit in the past but i think you guys have a an interesting kind of new take on on it right and i think it it, it seems to be working for the people that have been using the platform so far so i i think it's really great but 
we're coming to the end of the show. So let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about you guys and, and try out the platform. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in order to try out the platform, um, you can just go to diffractive.com. Uh, there you can try out a video on our site um, where you can you know, check out the, the UX design and also have access to our, our, well, it's a website now, but it'll be an app in the next month okay. uh, where you can save all of the items that you like while you're, while you're watching the video. Um, and then basically on any of our, uh, our current customers that have videos on their sites, uh, shout outs to my simple changes. Uh, in the front row, uh, Girls Got Glory. They all they all have our um, you know our 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 UX on their site. Um, but yeah, just go to the website and you can if you're a creator, we have a, a place where you can log in and you could try out our back end and start making some videos yourself. Uh, we we always want new users on board. We love talking to you, meeting you, understanding what your businesses are. And if if you're a viewer, you can just access the site and see what kind of uh, uh, videos we already have on board. Sure. Um, it's pretty simple. No, I, I think that's great, man. But I, I want to cover something quick before we go. Like you mentioned an app, so they can. How how does that kind of work? That's coming out. Yeah. So if if you're watching a video, um, whether it be you know, say it's on uh, the My Simple Changes website. Okay. If you like something that and then that he has put in his videos, you can actually save those items to your own profile. And okay. so maybe you didn't like. Yeah, maybe you didn't like, you know, that video and you never wanted to watch it again. If you're bored and you're sitting on a plane or train or, you know, whatever, similar to how you would treat Instagram or Pinterest, you can go into your profile and see those things that you like, which gives you an opportunity to go to the places where you can buy it or check out the photos and descriptions. Um, it's really an effort by us to help um, get eyeballs back on the things that content creators are trying to monetize, right? So. People are seeing these things in another place outside of their own website where they're distributing that content, um, which is, is super useful because a lot of these content creators, you know, they're using affiliate programs to make money. And if people are only seeing the links on their website, you know, they're missing out an opportunity to put them on multiple places. So, yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely a, I, th I think it's 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 pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think that's great, right? It's a nice addition. And I think there's a lot of people, obviously, if they're on the couch or something, they're watching content or, or browsing the internet or, or whatnot. And then, you know, they're they're potentially going to be on a computer within the next 24 to 48 hours, whether it's, you know, their personal one or their work computer or, or whatever, right? So I think having the, you know, the tie between the both platforms and devices is actually really interesting for you guys. And I think it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> we're trying to make it as seamless as possible. You know, sure. we want you to be able to access your information wherever you are. Sure. Um, so, and, yeah, and, that's the plan. And then just so people know, it's D, the letter I, F, R, A, C, T, I, V, E dot com. Just for the, for the spelling of the domain. Correct. But uh, Correct. Daniel, I really appreciate and, you taking time out of your day to be on the show. And I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. And hopefully we can see each other again at the Media Excellence Awards, you know, later this year or early next year. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Thanks, man. We'll talk soon. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. Also check us out on Facebook at Building the Future Show and follow us on Twitter at Building Show. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.